when I was going through my cancer journey, I reconnected with my beauty in the depths of my despair, in the depths of my heartbreak, in the depths of so much pain. And beauty was not the destination, but my vehicle to healing. It allowed me to deepen my connection to my own body. And in doing so, I literally rebirthed myself. Are you curious about discovering ways of making your life better? Then welcome to my podcast. I'm Bob Nickman, and this is The Exploding Human. Listen in while I talk with all kinds of people in the fields of personal growth, health and healing, alternative therapies, psychology, spirituality, environment, and the future. I'm looking for those answers that make life better for everyone. You'll meet cutting-edge practitioners, doctors, artists, filmmakers, business people, and those who have overcome challenges. The brave, the curious, anyone who is out there helping us humans to explore, expand, and explode. Hey, welcome to The Exploding Human. My name is Bob Nickman. My guest today is Mawish Said. She is an interior designer in New York City and a cancer survivor. And we're going to talk about the interplay between those two things in this episode. But first, I'd like to invite you to visit my website, theexplodinghuman.com. Over there, you can listen to episodes, read synopses, see photos of my guests. There's a little bio on myself. There's also a YouTube channel where you can listen. That is The Exploding Human with Bob Nickman. As I said, my guest today is Mawish Syed. She has been a designer in New York City for many decades, and we're going to be talking about how she incorporates uh, healthy choices into her designs and some of the influences that she had as a little girl in growing up in Pakistan. We also talk about how she healed herself from cancer and her book, Purgatory to Paradise, she unveils the profound influence of beauty as a healing force. She passionately explores how our surroundings shape our well-being, believing homes uh, should be both visually stunning and physically beneficial for our health. She talks very eloquently about the interplay between all these interests of hers and how she healed herself from cancer and transformed her life. So here she is. This is Mawish Syed. Good morning, Mawish. It's so great to have you on the show. And I'm, uh, we had a nice little talk before. And sometimes I wish I would re I would record those because we got into all kinds of. You started asking me about me, and I, which almost never happens. What? Uh, Thanks for well, having me, Bob. By the yeah. way, <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome. Glad you're here. Yeah, I mean, sometimes after people ask me, but not not usually before. But we, you know, we were talking about, and let's just go with this because this is, this was interesting. She asked me, ladies and gentlemen, what ex the exploding part of my uh, title is. And I was explaining it's explore, expand, and explode and become the most explosive, amazing, whatever human being you can do, you can be. And then you started to talk about, which I really loved, why that resonated with you. Can you repeat some of that or just? Uh... Absolutely. It would be my pleasure. So it actually is very close to my heart, Bob, because I often use this analogy about gunpowder, but in the most spiritual way, of course, and how I tie it to Islamic mysticism. So like you and I, we're by ourselves inert ingredients like gunpowder. But when we come together, we explode with ideas and creativity and connection, right? So why and how I link that back to Islamic mysticism is in Sufism, there is something called a wazifa or wadifa, depending on which dialect of Arabic you are speaking. Um, and basically what that is are the 99 divine names of Allah, uh, and you're given two names to repeat, kind of like a mantra, okay? And you're repeating them. And as you repeat them, you're given them specifically by your teacher. And you, when you repeat them, you arrive at a third unnameable place. And I liken it to when people meet and they have a conversation and a connection. We don't know that place. We can't predict that place, but it is such a beautiful thing. And 
we're living in a society that preemptively tries to eradicate uncertainty or even, um, you know, vaccinate ourselves against uncertainty in so many respects. And I come from a place where I have a deep reverence and appreciation for that unnameable place, for the unknown and the unspoken and the unseen. That's a, a great way to look at things because the other way that you were just talking about is fear. And mm -hmm. fear-based decision-making is not a wise way to go. It, it, usually you make the wrong choice. Uh, and and it's a fascinating thing how some people are embrace this sort of unknown, this thing that could happen that you don't know what's going to happen and trust that. And other people are absolutely terrified of it. That to me is where the difference in a successful uh, expanded life is and one that is very constricted. Mm, that's true. And, you know, courage is not the absence of fear. It's having that fear making peace with it and doing it anyway. There's a chapter in my book called Embracing the Unknown. And I describe that as becoming the mermaid. Because for me, the symbolism of the mermaid is, hey, let's not flail at the surface of things and fight the current. But let's dive into that unknown, dark indigo depths of our being and see what we can find. Yeah, it's scary, but, you know, having gone through what I went through um, in my cancer journey, I realized that that was really the best way. And I found out that I could breathe underwater. You know, I had a dream like that several times. I've had several dreams like that where I'm underwater, but I'm mm -hmm. breathing. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a little, when you're do, in that dream, and I think probably a lot of people have had it, you know, it's, it, it, you know, trying to analyze it is, you know, a little bit iffy, but the the experience when you when you wake up and you realize oh i was just you know literally underwater drowning uh but i wasn't drowning i was able to to actually breathe and do stuff under there so yeah. what does it really mean you know it's kind of a those are kind of amazing dreams i hope i have another one soon well you're remembering your yourself in the womb because we all were underwater before we were born we were all mermen, mer, mer, mer people, mermaids. Yeah. And I think um, that's an important thing to remember is that we can breathe through adversity. We can. And sometimes adversity can feel like you're drowning and that you're suffocating, right? But if we think about mare or la mer, which is the mother, the waters are actually life-giving. And um, that's the analogy I use a lot. So it's perfect that you had that dream, Bob. Thank you. <laughs> I don't even know why I'm thanking you, but thank you. So let's talk about your book uh, a little bit first, because it's about um, your your cancer. From It's called From Purgatory to Paradise, correct? That's by Dante, but mine is Purgatory to Paradise. Okay. And I... Take the from out, folks. Yeah, I took the, take the from <laughs> out. Exactly, exactly. And basically what I did was, well, I wanted to write this book to help other people because what I discovered, Bob, was so unique, absolutely and. Like anything I had experienced when I was going through my cancer journey, I reconnected with my beauty in the depths of my despair, in the depths of my heartbreak, in the depths of so much pain. And beauty was not the destination, but my vehicle to healing. It allowed me to deepen my connection to my own body. And in doing so, I literally rebirthed myself. Yeah, no, I, I it, you know, the terror of hearing, you know, a diagnosis like that for most people. I mean, it used to be almost a guarantee you're out, you know, uh, but it's not like that now for many situations. People are not only is there medical things that are amazing, but there's spiritual pieces to this thing that is and lifestyle changes that can happen where people can it's it's not a death sentence for and um and and so that's the that's the beauty of you know having you on the show to be able to talk about this because maybe there's somebody listening who's going through this 
right now. And they're going, right. oh, oh, what what can I do? Um, what was what were you like prior to the diagnosis? And I'm, and I'm not, you know, it, it, you can cover any area you want of what you were like, you know, body, mind, spirit, and then and then the, and what are you like now? And what and I guess what happened? Uh, you know, I, I would be as a listener, I would want to know what changed, and and you know, you don't. Um, well, go ahead. Just go ahead and say, you know, I, I'm trying to be delicate and um, and direct at the same time. So I'm I got stammering it, I got it. a little bit. It. It's okay. <laughs> we're we're tiptoeing into this. I I was, you know, I think we're all born with seeds. We're all born with certain seeds in our lives, and you know, certain events either water those seeds or certain environments encourage some seeds and others don't. And my seeds were always dormant inside of me. So I used the backbone of the mythology of Persephone, um, who is the goddess of the seasons. And she's the one who was abducted and taken down into the underworld. And I likened my cancer to Hades, but Hades became Persephone's husband. He became her lover. And so I decided that I was going to embrace this diagnosis and see it as an opportunity of what it could teach me. And who I was before Bob was innocent. I was innocent like Corey. Persephone gets her name only when she's initiated to the depths of herself, to her shadow. And I think we live in a society where we're afraid of our own shadow. I really truly mean that. We're afraid of that darkness. Um, we're afraid of the discomfort of sitting with less than perfect feelings. And I think in being able to face myself down there in my underworld, I was able to reach my real sovereignty, my true power. What do you think the thing that you were, I'm going to use the word most afraid of that you were able to look at and then realize you didn't need to be afraid of it. I mean, obviously everyone's afraid on some level to die, but I think it's something else beyond that because, you know, it's certainly intellectually, we know that's what's going to happen eventually, but and and in premature and well, all death is premature, but <laughs> in one way <laughs> with, especially with people you love, you don't like that, but the, um, was there something about the way you were living and you said innocent, but I'm not sure that's the thing. It, like, I mean, innocence is kind of a beautiful thing. I, I, I enjoy people that, that are, that are a little bit, uh, unscathed by the harshness of, of life. You know, it's like, it's, it's quite lovely to be around those kind of people. Uh, I don't even know what the question is again. I've, I've sort of lost, uh, you, do, <laughs> do you know what the question is? Like what, what, what was the thing that you kind of, and, and maybe there's no words for it, but what was the thing you, you went, Oh, I don't need to be, I don't need to be afraid of this, or this is, this is something, this is the thing that um, I really it's not. Have. It's not one thing. It's really not one thing. But when I speak of innocence, I speak of more probably naivete. It's 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 kind of, you know, you're uninitiated to deeper parts of yourself until sometimes you're going through hardship, right? And I've gone through other hardships in the past. So I kind of already had a sense of like, oh, what could this teach me? But frankly, I was also in um, a toxic relationship. And that's what I touch on in my book a little bit which is the connection between um, our emotions and our body, the mind-body-spirit connection, and the fact that, you know, most cancers are epigenetic, okay? So what does that mean? It means that it's not related to our genes. It's related to our lifestyle or our, our environment, and that includes the relationships that we have, the relationships that we have with ourselves and with others, the toxic, you know, materials that comprise our homes, which I ended up auditing my home when I was going through cancer, looking at it since it wasn't genetically linked. So then I said, okay, well, there's a reason this happened. I'm not going to, you know, sit down and, and just accept that, oh, you know, bad things happen to good people. I, I want to know what, 
did it? What was the cause? And my book explores all those levels from a spiritual, from a physiological, and from an emotional perspective. Yeah, it's amazing how many, well, things can be um, unhealthy for us and that, that um, people don't even look at sometimes. It's, you know, let's just talk about the home for a, for mm -hmm. a second because that's a very sort of concrete physical place that can have lots of toxicity in there, you know, yeah. from, from uh, mold to all, all kinds of, you know, things. Uh, and then the things we're putting in our bodies or not putting in our bodies that we do need. Um, that's a whole, I mean, that's, that's a lot of what, what, what I do on this show is to figure out what those things are for, for myself and for other people to, to realize maybe I'm poisoning myself um, in some ways. Right, right. So what I then did is really investigate and start researching. And I, I started studying quantum biology, circadian rhythm. I was already a materials um, consultant for a lot of architectural firms. So I started looking at it through the lens of toxicity and cancer and illness and endocrine disruption and all of that. And frankly, I'll just give your listeners a real, very strong um, tip here. Indoor air is far more polluted than outdoor air. Number one, <laughs> indoor air. I'm laughing because I, I have, you know, been studying some of this stuff myself. So yeah. Yeah. Ahead. And a silent killer in your home. And by the way, I have all the lists of this and, and lots of information on my website, claim your paradise, but it's your carpet, your carpeting, anything that's synthetic is incredibly toxic and the dust that it creates the nanoparticles that you're breathing in that you don't even realize it's it disrupts your meta your metabolism your absolute your mitochondrial function so when i say to my clients open your window yes from a circadian standpoint that's important to get the sunlight on your eyes and on your skin, but open your windows to increase air circulation, spend time outdoors. And this is an interior designer, but you know, I think that's the universe having a really great sense of humor because I learned to design myself from the inside out. And that's not just in terms of aesthetics, it's in terms of true alignment. And to me, that is real beauty, Bob. Real beauty is when we're in alignment on a spiritual and cellular level. And I have made it my life's mission to crack that code. Well, I find it really fascinating that you're uh, an interior designer. It's not a topic that I normally even talk about, but I think that there is an environmental piece to uh, the way we build things now uh, that is really damaging. Uh, the sealed environment is just, to me, is like, horrific. Like I've had jobs in office buildings with a sealed environment, not a ton of mm -hmm. them, but enough where when I walk in, I feel sick um, from yeah. the recirculated air to the materials that are in there, the plastics and all that stuff to, you know, whatever's going on in the ventilation system, which is, you know, who knows what's growing in there. Right. The fluorescent right. lights. When you, when you make that when I walk into a room like that, I feel, I don't feel good. I mean, you can really sort of, if, if you want to be aware, just how do you feel the second you walk into a place like that? And if it's, if it's in, you know, you're sort of trapped there if you're, if that's your job. Um, mm -hmm. And I remember once I was on a, working on a, on a, um, a TV show and the room we were in, I, there was another person on the show that knew about full spectrum lighting. So we started talking about it one day and we ordered full spectrum fluorescent um, tubes, you know, and to replace yeah. the ones that were there. And the people that walked in the next morning after we put them in, what's wrong? Something's wrong. This is horrible. What did you do? I don't like this. It was, it was a whole, it, it literally, it was a visceral uh, negative mm. response to actually having a healthier lighting now everybody got used to it and it was okay um but it was and there was you know it was a sealed environment there was one window but it was closed most of the time and it, if that's it so sad it, 
<laughs> and I remember thinking, like, I hate it in here. I feel like I'm. Tr- and there was only one tiny window in the corner, and I was like, this is. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons I just hated working there. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. It's just how I physically was responding to that, to that. It's funny. It's like a canary in a coal mine. If the plants die in there, you know, you're not doing so yeah. well. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, what plants? There were no plants. <laughs> that's, that's the other thing. And I want to talk about, because first of all, um, biophilia is the, uh, the connection of our biology with nature. Okay. And it's really important if you are in a closed environment, by the way, I have a great designer tri- tip for you. If I were you and I had to stay, I would invest in bringing plants. For millions of years, they have evolved to filter benzene, formaldehyde, all these things that, um, you know, are inside that, you know, sarcophagus of a building. And I I believe that uh, you can employ tips, real simple ones to help you if you are in an office space that is enclosed to surround yourself with plants. And I have a whole list of them because NASA um, has, it's out there, but I tested and vetted my top 10 that I think are fabulous. One of which I think is in the screen right now, um, which is Ficus Benjamina. I totally believe in their ability to filter your air, but not only, not only, what's also amazing is that, did you know, when you look at leaves, it actually affects your brain waves. It calms you down. You know, if you look at buildings and how we've created these boxes, right? Do boxes exist in nature? <laughs> Unless, do they exist in nature? Everything's a curve, Right. We're talking about the golden ratio. Do we employ the golden ratio when we're designing our buildings? So these kind of box, like, you know, coffins, virtual coffins that we're living in, I believe um, we can really create and design beauty within that box if we so choose. And when I say beauty, I mean, from a neurological standpoint, from a spiritual standpoint and a biological standpoint. One of the things that happens, I think, is when you're around those types of boxy environments and toxic things, you get desensitized to act to what they're actually doing to you. You're not, you know, and that's why those people reacted so strongly to the to the full spectrum lighting. They were de- completely desensitized to what was actually a healthier choice. And, and so, you know, we ignore that until something happens. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we've villainized UV, right? Um, A lot of windows are laminated to block off vital portions of the spectrum of sunlight coming in through our windows, right? So it's even more important to try to open your window because sunlight's not polarized and it can bounce off surfaces. I often employ mirrors in strategic ways, like a vampire hunter, to bring and cast, um, bring the sunlight into your space. And, you know, you just don't need sunlight on your, in your eyes. You need it on your skin, Bob. We need sunlight on our skin. It gives our body a signal and it starts a cascade effect to basically run our system and our systems aren't running. And that's why cancer is the number two, um, you know, cause of death in the United States because we are already degrading our system, our bodies by the way we live. And then the toxins come in so much easier because we've broken down our telomeres and our DNA. So that's a real testament to living a a lifestyle that has a connection to the outdoors or that is based on that, actually. You know, I I have to say that, you know, when when I think about what people in the United States might see as a primitive culture. And I'm saying that with the, you know, a little sarc- you know, sarcastically because, okay, we've got uh, a, a X number of people sleeping in, I'm going to just get real simple, sleeping in a hut or a cave or uh, let's say just a hut. How can those people live like that? There's no this, there's no that. But then they're outside like 90% of the day. It's just a place to sleep at night. And, 
you know, if cooking is done outside and they're out, people are outside doing things. And it's like, is that primitive or is that actual um, healthy biological living? I actually grew up in Pakistan. I grew up sleeping under the stars. So interestingly enough, from an architectural standpoint, Arabic architecture, Islamic architecture has a central courtyard. It has usually a water feature, but, you know, we would eat in underneath the sky as much as possible because the rooms were arranged in the periphery. So there was always a beautiful space for congregation. And I remember summertime, we would either sleep on the roof or we would sleep in the courtyard um, on, you know, woven jute beds. And it was the most divine sleep. And even like jolly, which is a term for a perforated screen, that's, you know, we've seen Taj Mahal with um, the really beautiful carved lattice um, mar in marble, but sandstone and other materials. I love taking those, what I call ancient traditions that were incredibly wise, cost effective, and good for you because they've been perfected over hundreds of years and often thousands of years. And, you know, if you look at your human, um, the whole time of how we've lived here on this earth as a 24 hour cycle, we've only, we're talking the last 30 seconds of our human evolution that we have incorporated Wi Fi and, you know, that toxic soup and um, all this new electrical and electrified technology that is also wreaking havoc on our biology. So going back to that, I wouldn't call it primitive, I would call it ancient and incredibly wise, that those things that we have underestimated and often ignored in the pursuit of what? Improvement? Improvement, yes. That's the that's the lie oh, right there. Is yeah, what's that improved? Is what is actually improved if you ask if you ask that question? The further humans move away from their natural biology, the more they get sick. Yeah. The, the, and the less connected they are to the source of where they come from, whatever you want to call it. Right. And that seems to be um, backwards thinking that's, you know, that uh, that's not helping at all. It's hurting. It's hurting. And I'm wondering, as a species, are we going to figure this out? Or are we going to just keep heading in that direction? I mean, it seems like there's people like yourself, and, you know, I'm curious about these things, and I try to do do some kind of a balance because I do have to live in the modern world, and so do you. You know, what is what is the best way to, to do that? And it, to me, it's about information and, and also staying in touch with whatever you intuitively uh, experience in, in any situation and not looking the other way uh, in terms of how you're responding in your, in your body and your heart and, and those kinds of things. And it's, it, and if you walk in, let's say you just walk into a, a room, like I was talking about, you don't feel good. Don't ignore that just because yeah. everybody else in there is ignoring it. Ask yourself, what just happened to me? Why do I feel off in some way? Um, and that's, that requires a little bit of courage. <laughs> and self-trust. I call it, you know, listening to my inner GPS. And that's what I wrote about in my book is I wasn't listening to my inner GPS. I was ignoring the signs. I was ignoring the signals that my body was telling me because, you know, this false virtue of a good woman is someone who is stoic and handles pain and trauma with grace and, you know, shows up with her little apron on and presents you the dish, whether she's suffering or not. That's how I was raised. And I talk yeah. about that because I have had loved ones in my life and women in the families and the generations previous to me, as much as they bestowed their beautiful wisdom and how to you know, sew and embroider and knit and cook and all that. The other thing that they also gave me was this legacy of masking my pain, masking, my, you know, covering up that internal GPS, that voice. And to claim and own and claim my paradise, literally claim my paradise, I had to learn how to listen to myself again. 
that was not always easy. And it's not easy because sometimes when you do listen to that voice, you have to make some drastic changes, Bob. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes <laughs> you sometimes you lose friends. <laughs> yeah. Family members sometimes even it's it's it, where you just go I can't, it's just not true so I'm not going to do it. it you know and and then it's like well the, you've always done it that way you need to keep doing that well I'm not gonna yeah. and yeah. then you have a conflict and you either work out the conflict or you have to go a different way right and, and it's, right. it's 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 a little bit uh, it's a little sad sometimes where you. you you know, it can be lonely. It can be lonely. It can be like, can I have me and still have you too? Can I still maintain that connection with you? Or is it only conditional on me being an old version of myself, right? An unhealed version of myself. So when you do heal, when you do evolve, and sometimes people do not and cannot or will not choose not to evolve with you. And that's, right. that's, that's hard. Well, an interesting thing, and I, I, I'll use the example of um, people pleasing. I want to be liked. I want, I want people to like me. So I'm going to do kind of what they want, and um, or go, even go out of my way to uh, preemptively do what they, I think they want. <laughs> and then you, if and then if you say, well, I don't like this. This actually doesn't work for me in this situation. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do it. Not only do the people um, are, are they don't just get confused by it; they are resentful because you are changing. When you change the script on some people, they get really pissed off. They don't like that. Well, you did it before. What happened? Well, I did it for the wrong reasons, and I don't like it, and I'm not getting anything out of it. I'm not going to do it anymore. Right? Well, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's really interesting because in that change in your own evolution, there is that kind of casting off, right? And one of the things I want to bring us back to is the cycles of life and death and rebirth. And I think it's really important to recognize that we're constantly evolving our on a cellular level, our cells are regenerating, right? Mm -hmm. And our relationships in that way, also are regenerating. And one of the things that I really touched on in my book was the idea of death and how we've villainized it, even when it comes to death of relationships, right? Like that's a failure. Yeah. Like somehow death is a failure. And that's actually a misguided way and a very harsh way in a state of judgment about ourselves which is really unkind. We're not kind to ourselves, Bob. And I think death is, if you look at nature, everything is being recycled. Soil is decaying matter, but it's full of life. And if we think about what's organic, we, we everybody, you know, that really wonderful phrase, oh, we want or to eat organic, but we're not organic with ourselves. We're not organic with our lives because beautiful, beautiful, nourishing things grow out of death and decay. We can't avoid death in terms of ourselves, in terms of our relationships and the actual death. Everyone's going to die. But would I rather live a life where I'm already dead to begin with? And that's my purgatory. That's like not being brave not choosing the things that I want, not listening to my inner GPS, but going with the flow, being a people pleaser. I, I don't think it's either or, but just to kind of make this point, I think it's really important to appreciate death, to appreciate what death, what opportunity that death gives you. It is a whole different way that to look at death that way than certainly the way we look at it in the United States for that's the only experience I have is living here is it's the bad thing that happens at the end and let's get them in wherever they're going quick, you know, the body, whether it's a cremation or a burial and forget about it and move on. Look, there are people who are suffering dementia and Alzheimer's and all sorts of calamities where their quality of life is severely compromised yeah. is the goal just to keep them alive for as long as possible. Because what we fear, like there's this fear 
constantly in our society and it's a taboo subject to even talk about. Um, it, it's, it's, it's something that really occupies me. And until cancer hit me, I wasn't, you know, I, I admit that I kind of understood what cancer was, but until it happens to you, then you're like, wow, I really need to face this. But otherwise, you know, when I was going through it, um, there were certain people who couldn't handle it. They oh, couldn't absolutely. handle it. Yes. Right. They couldn't yeah. handle uh, they, they. Oh, I don't know what to say. So I'm not going to say anything. Well, it, and if you take it even the next level to me, it's, uh, and I've said this just you know, sort of jokingly, but it's sort of true. It's like, I, I don't want to catch it. You yeah. know, even though, yeah. even though it's not, it doesn't work that way, but, but catch it even psychically from I mean, yes. be around it, because what if, something about it goes in to, to me and I have to look at my own, you know, mortality, which is, can be very terrifying in, in if you're somebody that's not really understanding or living in a way that's um, what you like the way you're talking about. Well, I wrote an article. I um, It was published in elephants and tea magazine last year. It's called you are not alone. And I love you too. And I connected, um, Johan Hari's TED Talk, and he was talking about the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, it's connection. Mm -hmm. And so I connected it to cancer. And I said, the opposite um, of my self-abandonment is reconnection with myself. And I discussed how I felt like some of, you know, some of the people thought I had cooties or something like, what, like, it's a great what? word. I haven't heard that for a while. <laughs> like, I, I'm like, I'm dating myself. You, but, yeah. <laughs> no, but I, like, I remember that in elementary school, you got right? cooties and then uh, you got so-and-so's cooties. Right. And I'm like, what do I, what am I like? <laughs> I do I have cooties? I put, what is it? Are you allergic to, to, to this word? Like, oh my God, you know? So I think it's important to recognize that even when you're grieving, you know, we can't grieve in isolation and we need each other. There's a beautiful interconnected and interweaving of our societal tapestry that we actually are missing because, again, going back to those ancient traditions, I come from a very strong tradition of honoring death and and coming together in a community when that happens in a household. And I was very much exposed to that as a child. And I wasn't afraid. I lived with four generations under one roof. I learned how to braid on my great grandmother's hair. Oh, that is a great image. I just love that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think um, it's really, I would like to get back to, designing a way to live. And the subtitle of my book is how cancer helped me design an authentic life. And what I meant by that is owning and honoring my roots and all the things I learned and their stories in there from my childhood and my love of snakes. And um, it's actually the symbol that I use and go back to again and again, because it represents female sexuality and the divine feminine, which also I write about with the kind of parallel um, mythology of Eve and the snake. You know, what's great about snakes. They're not slimy. They're not. No, they're dry. Yeah. They look slimy, but they're not. They're gorgeous. Yeah. We had a snake uh, here at my house uh, growing up. My son had a snake. What kind? It was a ball python. Lovely. Yeah. And what so, was its uh, name? Blaze. Blaze. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how that happened, <laughs> but it was Blaze. But, the, you know, the interesting thing is that you feed the snake a live uh, rat, basically. That's what they eat. And, um, you know, you put it in the cage and uh, snake se senses it. And then it just paralyzes it and then swallows it whole. And to, I think to a lot of, to some people, they would be sort of oh, horrified. This animal ate another animal. Well, that's, 
who that's again nature you're not going to change that that's how those things live and the you know the rat signed up for it the snake signed up for it <laughs> this is just what it is so it gives you a whole sort of another type of way of looking at things when you're connected to you know I'm, it wasn't outside this was happening but it was happening and and then you get to watch um the snake kind of mellow out for a while you can know and and then it sheds uh, at a certain point in the the cycle and that when that skin comes off that's a whole other thing too so it's you get when you get to watch these things happen there there's a a, a mind experience of learning but there's also a tactile uh, experience that happens because you're not only are you touching these things you're touching the, the rat you're touching the the snake you're touching you're doing the skin you're cleaning the cage you're doing all these things that um are not um they don't make you money <laughs> they don't make you famous they don't make you successful they don't do anything other than the most important thing which is you're connected to something that is you know from the earth so i found that to be a valuable thing to, for uh, my son to have and for you know me to be a part of I love that. I love that. And you know what? It gives you so much respect for life and this ecosystem that we've divorced ourselves from in, in the modern world. You know, uh, it's, I grew up with, you know, chickens and uh, sheep and, and goats and, and learning how to milk cows and things like that. So, and how to churn butter and how to make yogurt, all those things from scratch. So I have a deep respect for life. Um, and deep feather or chicken. Um, but it's, it, te it gives you respect. It gives you respect for the food that you eat. It gives you respect for and a veneration that I think is really missing. So it's not like this, you know, wrapped in plastic product that you buy at the grocery store. It was a living creature and I'm a very happy carnivore. I, <laughs> I just, you know, people look at me and they're like, you must be vegetarian. I'm like, no, it's very important for our bodies to imbibe protein in that way. And I have a deep veneration for life in all its forms. And, you know, it is money is, it's just a medium. It's, it's an opportunity to exchange energy with one another. And maybe that's, that's really how I feel. And I feel like right now in this phase of my life, the statesman part portion of my life, I will be doing myself and others a disservice if I don't share the wisdom that I have, Bob. If I don't speak yeah. and explode into um, a kaleidoscope of color and and light um, and allow that to, you know, affect even in one small percentage any human being, um, it would be my honor to do. Well, that's a beautiful thing. I appreciate that. And as I'm sure everyone else does, because those kinds of people help a lot of people that you probably will never meet in, in person, but you'll still have an effect on them. So yeah. in addition to um, you being uh, an interior designer, you also have a website that does what and how do people <laughs> find you? What goes it's on over there? What goes on over there? <laughs> Claim your paradise. So my book was called Purgatory to Paradise. And I realized in order for me to claim my own, I wanted to share these pomegranate seeds of wisdom that Persephone um, imbibed like I did. And Claim Your Paradise has, a, it's a really unusual way of designing your space from a health point of view. And I have audit lists. I have ways to design a quantum home. I have a course for people who are going through cancer treatment or any illness for that matter to not only design and there's um, lessons on healing modalities and how to design your body and what kind of nutrition work for me, but how to create rituals of reverence and have a blueprint that will allow you to experience your own healing oasis in your home right here, right now. So get out of your purgatory. You have the ability to design your paradise at claim your paradise. 
So check it out. And for your listeners, I also have a gift, which is claimyourparadise.com slash opt-in, O-P-T dash I-N. And that is my three things you can get right now that are not expensive. I'm a high-end designer in New York. And I believe that everybody deserves beauty. And those are my top three things that I think um, you should have in your home. And um, that's for your listeners as well. Well, how kind. Very nice. And when you when you design for people, uh, when you say you're high-end, these uh, people obviously have enough money to do take your suggestions if you have if you have suggestions that they like i i just found out that there is just found out this year there is drywall that's not paper that doesn't get wet and moldy if it, it or mold if it gets wet i didn't even know that existed well it's probably a little more expensive than the the stuff that you get that's you know, sometimes that drywall, I found out, and this is just a little builder thing that I was learning about. Sometimes when it gets delivered to like, let's say Home Depot, there's already moisture in it. So you're going to put mm-hmm. it up and it's going to get moldy like right away. Right, right. So there yeah. are there are a lot of products that you can, um, with some research, find out. And you probably know a lot of this stuff being a designer that you can start, if you're going to build something, start that way. So you don't have problems down the road. And yes, it probably will be more expensive on the A side, but on the long term, no, no, it won't be. Unfortunately, we're living in a society, I'm going to wax rhapsodic about the good old days, but you know, (laughs) (laughs) why not? (laughs) Like it's, it's so wild to me how in, again, in the, in the name of improvement, we've actually not improved we've, we've gone backwards and all these old materials that we used were actually healthy and good for us. Right. And in our, you know, in our race to build, get it in budget, get it in budget. There are (laughs) budgets are, yeah, they're important, but there are certain things you don't want to compromise the money for and your health, I think comes first. And Beauty, again, what I mean by beauty, as someone who's done fashion and jewelry design and interiors, for me, beauty is in the materials too. It's the integrity of the materials that you surround yourself with, including the people and and the food that you eat. And I think life can be actually simplified. We've made it more complicated, Bob. I believe in simplifying things. So my suggestions are actual simple suggestions that you can implement today. Yeah, and they're so simple you haven't thought of them. Right, they're in your face. They're like, right, and sometimes what's closest to us, what's right in our face, you, you're blind to. So it's, you know, of course, I would hope no one has to go through cancer in order to get to that place. But if I can help you prevent illness and prevent something like cancer, um, I would do my best. Yesterday, I was talking to someone who's a, a geriatric uh, pharmacologist, but also somebody who works in um, nursing homes, assisted livings, hel- helps patients there. But she's a fitness person and a nutrition, so she she does a lot of things. So she comes from she kind of straddles both worlds. And she was telling me that the age of the people in these assisted livings is getting younger and younger and younger. People early, as young as 40s and 50s are in these um, places now with, you know, diabetes and all kinds of things that are, are literally preventable by lifestyle. They're lifestyle diseases. So, you know, it's, um, it's worth to me, it's worth doing a little bit of investigating about what is the best way for me to live as this biological and spiritual organism that's got this temporary, you know, visit here on Earth in this form that, that you know, what do you do to make that the best, you know? It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah, exactly. I, mean, I, I have an audit list on my website that you can download and you can go through it. I try not to overcomplicate. It's, it's. I think pretty well-rounded and not only do I say, Oh, that sucks, but I also give you (laughs) swaps that you can have 
So it's not like, oh my God, you know, a lot of people complain. Everything's toxic. Who cares? Like everything's toxic. And then they just kind of dismiss everything. So I think it's important when you, you know, you alert someone to a problem that you also have the solution. So when I bring something up, I try to say, hey, well, you know, this is not going to work, but I have a solution. How about this? How about this swap? How about changing this around? And I'm very solution minded. It's it's how I've always functioned as a designer. I had to come up. I had to build the solution, literally. So it's it's kind of like it's my sweet spot. It's it's fun. It's fun. It's you know creative constraints. I I like being creative, given a challenge and a, a design challenge in that way. Constraints actually make for more creativity total freedom is in creating sometimes can really be a detriment. You know, it's, it's, it, it, the challenge of figuring something out with limitations is really uh, rewarding. And that's, I think where, where things really can really be amazing. So Agreed. This, this idea of a constraint being a bad thing is not true. I'm with you there. It's scientifically proven that more creativity happens when you have limitations, Yeah, I remember whether that's some- time. Yeah, yeah. I remember something reading where air conditioning, which you know, take it or leave it, but air conditioning was in, was <clears throat> invented in the winter somewhere. Some I forget who mm. invented it. Look it up. I could be wrong. I just make stuff up sometimes. I like that. <laughs> but I read it. I read it. <laughs> I never. I never vetted it. I didn't care. I just like the idea. <laughs> You know, I've spent a lot of time researching and I have my certification in quantum biology. I really love the fact that I come from a very diverse background. I'm a multi-potentialite and there's, there's, you know, there's, there's roles for us. There's roles for us. I, I believe that, you know, there are other people who are specializers and there's other, others who are interdisciplinary, who are bridges, who actually can assess from a different vantage point. I think we all are viable and a necessary part of society. And for me, I have definitely recognized that my strength is being able to interpret and bring together and simplify in a process or in some design advice which is way more than just, hey, that's going to make your living room look sensational. (laughs) But (laughs) that's great, too. That's great, too. But I've done that. I've done that for a long time. What really gets my juices flowing is, wow, this is beautiful. And it actually helps you become more beautiful. You become more beautiful with this. Well, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate your message. And uh, folks, go, go get her book. Because, and the website sounds like there's, as you say, interdisciplinary. There's all kinds of stuff from design to health. So it's, uh, and if you don't think those things connect, you'd be wrong. (laughs) I like the way you talk, Bob. I like the way you talk. (laughs) Thank you. Well, you have a fantastic day. I hope you you have a nice steak uh, for dinner. And maybe some other delicious things. I don't know why I said that because, you you know, I eat meat too once in a while. You read my mind. We eat steak at least three times or yeah. two times a week. Yeah. I never loved it, but I, but I, sometimes I do. I kind I kind of let my body tell me when mm-hmm. it's time. Got it. Yeah. I don't know if I'll leave that in. Maybe I will. We'll see. Well, thanks for being on the show and any, any uh, folks say the name of the website again, so people can find you and your book and all your wonderful message. We'll end with your, your, your website. Thank you. It's claimyourparadise.com. Claimyourparadise.com. You can't afford not to go there, folks. Thanks, Smosh. My pleasure. Really lovely speaking with you. You too. Much appreciation for you folks listening to The Exploding Human. The website is theexplodinghuman.com. The YouTube channel is The Exploding Human with Bob Nickman. Once again, I want to thank Mawish Syed for being on the show. Check her out at claimyourparadise.com. Have a fantastic day. Thank you.